So we're talking to Ethan Ware, from, uh, who's an attorney with Williams Mullen down in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Ethan, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. Look forward to speaking with you. Now, I've seen you speak at many conferences, uh, presentations, very, very insightful presentations at plating and finishing conferences. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in finishing and what you've done. Uh, I, I, you've probably defended some uh, platers uh, when, when they've had some issues, right. haven't you? Yes. Environmental regulatory law is all I've ever practiced. That's been my boutique practice since uh, beginning uh, finishing law school and entering the, the business of practice of law. I've only represented manufacturers and industry in the context of environmental. And of course, a big component of the environmental regulatory focus since day one has been the electroplating industry or surface finishers. Um, it started out with the RICRA listing of hazardous waste, F006. Um, it started out with the, the closure of, of, of surface impoundments that were used to manage wastewater from electroplating operations. And so in the 80s, when that in, inertia began from EPA mm -hmm. to really go after industry with regulatory restraint, electroplaters were in the center of it, and my practice was uh, dovetailing with that representation. And over the years, we've represented integrated systems, job shops, uh, in, in uh, super fun cases, hazardous waste uh, disposal cases, hazardous waste compliance, container management, air permitting, wastewater discharges. Every environmental media is really mm. regulated at the electroplating shop. And so it's just a nature of being an attorney that specializes in regulations. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's talk about this EPA questionnaire. Uh, it's going out. They've identified close to 2000. I think it's 1800 and change shops that they want to answer this questionnaire. It's a voluminous questionnaire. Uh, sort of mind boggling uh, somewhat. Uh, and it's in regard to how the EPA wants to, uh, I guess, address uh, PFOS specifically in the finishing industry. Uh, from an attorney's perspective, uh, and from what you've seen over the years, what is the EPA trying to do here? Uh, and how uh, is this, how did this all come about? Let's just put it that way. Under the Clean Water Act, there's no question that EPA is trying to do their job. The problem seems to be that rather than limiting it in scope to the objectives of the Clean Water Act and to the, to the way the regulations are typically developed, EPA seems to have gone beyond that now. Under the Clean Water Act, every industry, including electroplaters, are subject to something called effluent guidelines. And those effluent guidelines are limits for the concentration of metals or caustics or other pollutants that might be in your wastewater. Under the Clean Water Act, Section 308, EPA has authority to investigate and request data and information through a mechanism like the information request that's about to go out mm -hmm. in order to properly write Clean Water Act guidelines or effluent limitations. The problem with this document is it goes well beyond that. PFAS and its components, uh, the, the, the polyfluoroacyl compounds, are not regulated hazardous substances. They're not regulated criteria pollutants yet. They may be in the future. And this seems to be an, an, an effort by EPA to get way ahead of the ball game and to set guidelines, to set limits, to set regulatory controls and treatment technology requirements for electroplaters in particular uh, before the information about risks associated with these compounds is known. And that's part of their job, but it appears that they've gone beyond it in the scope of this uh, particular questionnaire. Gotcha. Yeah, it's voluminous. It's I know it's broken into I think nine sections and yes. uh, you know wastewater generation, uh, flow management, permit requirements. It gets into financials, uh, other environmental. Um, from an attorney's perspective and an advice of a, of a to to shops, what should they do to prepare for this questionnaire? Uh, how are they? How how should they, should they get ready? It's very voluminous. Most importantly, Tim. Under the Clean Water Act, the 
the recipient's going to be asked to sign a certification that the information they provide is accurate, has been investigated, and been honestly answered. It's a felony not to answer accurately and consistent with the facts as you understand them at your business. So the, the first and most important thing every electroplater or surface finisher should know that receives this questionnaire is they have to be 100% candid and honest. And failure to do so can be a, a liability or a risk for the company. Right. In addition to that, the scope of the questions are going to be pretty expansive about not just PFAS, but other wastewater pollutants, because they ask about PFAS, and then they, for every question, there's a PFAS question. There is then a question about those pollutants excluding the PFAS compounds, uh, PFOS, PFOA, some of the others. And so there is uh, an obligation to understand your wastewater system, to understand your wastewater treatment, to understand your compliance record. They go into other areas. They ask about solid waste disposal and whether any of the biosolids generated at your wastewater treatment plant have gone off site. If so, where? They want to know about the land application of those sludges because if they were applied to agricultural operations, there are certain prohibitions and certain restrictions that can be triggered. If, if your wastewater is going to a publicly owned treatment works and there's been PFAS compounds in them, uh, in the wastewater, those PFAS compounds will wind up in this biosolids from the publicly owned treatment works. And those then in turn land applied, which will bring restrictions. And so this information is a cascading, has a cascading effect. It's designed to evaluate the scope of the use of, of PFAS compounds at your facility and how they may have affected the environment. I would bring one thing to everyone's attention who's in the business of chromium electroplating. Back in the 1990s, we all became subject to an air uh, program called NESHAP or MACT, uh, which stands for National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants. And the requirement of that program for a lot of surface finishers was to use a surfactant or a suspension agent on the surface of your electrolytic tanks. In so doing, limiting the air emissions of chrome and other hazardous air pollutants. A lot of those surfactants were PFAS compounds. And this, and this particular questionnaire asks about not as far back as 2010, 20, uh, 2010 or, or nine or five, but in recent years, have you continued the use of those surfactants? And if so, what kind, who was the manufacturer, how much, et cetera. They also wanna know if we have used any other coatings or metal compounds that would have contained PFAS. Did we purchase any parts or chemicals that contain PFAS during the last uh, three to, to five years. That's important. Uh, a lot of parts come coated with PFAS compounds. They're corrosion resistance. There's, there's uh, you know, uh, maybe fire, flame retardant in fabrics, but they're designed with a good goal in mind, but now the use of those products at our facilities might trigger response to questionnaires uh, that exposes to some risk and some liability. Right. right. We should mention uh, the EPA, I know they've told me that uh, they are following up every questionnaire by their intent is to go do an inspection at the facility. So there's that too, is that they're going to be possibly showing up with that. Um, you know, fr from a, you know, legal implications, like you mentioned, they're signing a document uh, which could possibly get them into some type of, of issue. Uh, I would assume that every finisher should probably uh, reach out uh, to their uh, attorneys or, or somebody, yourself or somebody, to maybe get some guidelines on, on, on this. I, I would say before uh, that would be, what would be your suggestion to that? Would it be that to that extent? Yes, Tim, we're, we're certainly making that suggestion to our clients that are involved in the surface, fin fin surface finishing industry. And here's why. You hit on it. It's not just the information being accurate, which is important, 
it's not just that the information exposes us to other areas of liability or risks uh, for what what liability we may be may have to PFAS compounds. It also exposes us to site visits because this the second part of that section 308 is not just the authorization to request the information, but it provides express authorization to EPA to visit the site to determine if the information is accurate and to follow up with enforcement and investigations necessary to make sure the information is accurately reported. So we're recommending that you prepare now. You know, mm -hmm. understand what your products that you've brought to the facility contain. Uh, understand what chemicals or coatings you might have or have used. Understand whether those, if there's any data, what that data looks like. And I will tell you, uh, there is certainly going to be a request if you have even non-reportable data that references PFAS or any of its components, the questionnaire asks that it be produced and it be attached to the response and be provided uh, to the EPA. Now, hmm. an, an important limitation on this whole report, Tim, is that it is limited to chromium metal finishing operations. That's a defined term. It's very important that industries that are not subject to the questionnaire, just because they're in surface finishing, they may be able to opt out, that they that they go through that, invest, that, that definition thoroughly and determine whether it applies to them now or at any time during the, the applicable period. Hmm. You know, you and I had spoke a couple uh, a months ago, I guess, about a story I was working on where we talked about, you know, people may say, I've never used a PFOS in my system. Uh, and they, some I know, and it was in the story that some discovered, uh, they did some very expensive testing and found out it was in their system. Uh, and then were able to trace it back to it was coming in through parts from their customer. And like you mentioned, it could come in through many different ways, not just if, had they used PFOS or any other type thing before. And that raises even more, I think, legal implications for a finisher, right? Is that he's, uh, may, you know, swear that he's never used this, but somehow he's got it. And he now is responsible, or he or she is now responsible, correct? There's no, you know, I didn't mean to, it, they are now responsible if that's the case, correct? That's right. It's an objective test. It's strict liability, if you will. Mm -hmm. If you've used parts with PFAS, you're obligated to tell about it. Now, that place places a legal dilemma on every uh, chromium metal finishing operation. Do Does that facility test its in, its chemicals? Does it rely on the SDS? Does it look to products and parts that are that have been coded perhaps in uh, China or Korea or other countries where the standards regarding PFAS compounds have not caught those of the United States? And what are we receiving? Do we want to know that? If we do want to know it, to what extent? And so, you know, from, from our standpoint, it's important from a legal standpoint that the companies go through that exercise with counsel and make a good reasoned legal decision on what they should or shouldn't be doing. Right, right. Like I said, you've been around this for many years. You've seen this before, uh, not just in finishing, but with other manufacturing operations. Uh, final question is sort of, what do you see coming out of this? What is EPA going to do with the data, uh, with the visits? What do you see, what could you might see down the road how this will impact the uh, finishing industry? Well, there's little doubt that effluent guidelines will be the target of this uh, particular questionnaire. There will be new wastewater effluent limits for the metal finishing industry regarding PFAS and the associated compounds. Um, I think there will also be a further look at much like a domino effect. And by that, I mean, once it happens to this industrial sector, the next one will be the target. It might be fabrics next. It, it might be um, the, those that are in the, the AFFF business. But there is certainly going to be some movement toward some standard affluent limitations applicable to those industries uh, that have used the compounds. And we're certainly the first target. I'd point out something about this questionnaire, Tim, that I didn't really focus on until you and I talked about doing this today. And that is it, it requests information about your facility, 
and about your parent corporation. If you have an affiliated entity, or in some cases, one close nearby that is affiliated with your business, you may have to do more than just understanding what's going on in your workshop. You may be subject to effluent limitations, to restrictions on land application of biosolids, not just at mm -hmm. your business, but at the parent business or associated or affiliated entities uh, that operate with you. So it's got the potential for tentacles. Uh, EPA is always mm -hmm. um, do exercising, kind of pushing the envelope to try to protect the environment they believe in the best way possible. And uh, they do that through regulations. And this is a hallmark of how they do it. Hmm. Yeah. Well, like I said, it's going to be very interesting over the next couple of months or year, whenever this gets uh, taken care of. Again, people can reach you at uh, www.williamsmullen.com. They can go to your site. They want to reach out to you. But I think it's going to be imperative for uh, most anybody in the finishing industry before they go down this road is to get some legal advice and then have it available to them all the way through. Because it's it may be a, a rough ride for some people, I'm sure. It certainly exposes uh, entities to risk. And we're you have to realize as a business that risk management is part of your platform and that's what they need to take advantage, take advantage right. of. All right. Well, thank again, Ethan, thanks for, I appreciate the time. You're welcome, Tim. Have a nice day.